Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Our lectionary readings for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost focus pretty intensely on the topic of forgiveness. Uh, Archbishop um, uh, Bogiers of the Swedish Lutheran Church once said that uh, forgiveness is the air that the church breathes. Uh, And that's going to be our emphasis in our readings for today. And as we look towards those texts, we begin our service by receiving the forgiveness that we ourselves so desperately need. So I invite you to stand as you're able as we confess our sin and hear God's word of forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Dear friends, as scripture tells us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Dear friends, in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. 
Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, good will to all. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is from Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave us this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servant of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, we are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, with hope that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, remember how he cares for me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, with hope that is within me. Bless his Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, remember how he cares for me, bless his holy name. 
merciful and gracious, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He is not quick to blame us, nor keep his anger long. Compassion comes from the Lord above. Bless the Lord, O my soul, with all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, remember how he cares for me. Bless his holy name. Judgment is not rendered according to our sins. He offers us love instead. Higher than the heavens and wider than the earth is the Father's compassion for his own. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, with all that is within me. Bless his heart. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, remember how he cares for me, bless his holy name. Our second reading is from Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they will stand or fall and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let it be fully convinced in their own minds, for those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord, and those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister, or you? Why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall praise, give praise to God. So then, each of us, will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Be Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Peter came and said, Jesus, or Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, 
one who owed him 10,000 talents, was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payments to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Elizabeth, you want to come up for children's time? You want to come up? Yeah, come on up. The rest of us will sing. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning, children of God. Thanks for coming up. Thanks, Ava, for coming up to you. All right, I brought a a whiteboard with me uh, today because I wanted to share with you um, from when I was a kid, about your age, uh, when I was in elementary school anyway. I know that you're up to middle school now. But uh, when I was in elementary school, uh, if you were misbehaving, maybe you're talking in class or you're doing something you're not supposed to do, I remember how the teacher would... uh, just go over to the board, the chalkboard or the whiteboard or whatever, and the first thing they'd do is this. They'd write your name. And that got your attention. If the teacher put your name on the board, it was uh, his or her way of saying, I see you and I know what you're up to over there. And uh, usually it was enough to uh, make you start behaving right. But if you continued to misbehave, whatever it was, chatting with your neighbor or what have you, they'd go up to your name and boop, they put a check. Now they mean business, Right. And if later in the day, this would go on for the whole day, because you're in the same class in elementary school, you're in the same class for the whole day. So if later on in the day, uh, you forget and you start talking to your friend again, oh, you get another check. And then I think different teachers had different uh, numbers of checks that they would allow. But I think by the time you got to your third check, that meant you're out the door. That meant that you were headed to the principal's office and nobody wants to go to the principal's office, Right. So that's how things worked in my elementary class. I don't know if they still do things like that. But um, in our gospel reading for today, uh, Peter is talking to Jesus about forgiveness. And he says, Lord, if somebody sins against me, how many times should I forgive them? Maybe seven times? He thought that was a pretty good number. Thought he was probably, probably thought he was being generous. So there's three on there. So he had four, five, six, seven. Peter thought maybe seven checks and then I can ditch this person. They don't have to deal with him anymore. They can just I can get rid of him, right? And Jesus says, no, Peter, I tell you, not seven times, but, do you remember what it said? Seventy-seven times. Am I going to put 77 checks on here? There's a bunch. I'm just, I'm, I can't even do 77 checks. Can you imagine trying to keep track of 77? It would fill the whole board, right? Now, what Jesus is saying here is that as Christians, we forgive each other. As Christians, we don't give up on each other. We continue to extend that forgiveness. Now, do you think that that means that Jesus doesn't care about misbehaving? No, he cares about that. Do you think it means that Jesus doesn't care if um, people are hurting you? No, Jesus cares, cares very much about that. In fact, eyeballs, look at me. I want you to make sure that I see you hearing me. 
Forgiveness does not mean that it's okay for someone to hurt you. Yeah, it's really important that we don't misunderstand what forgiveness is all about. What Jesus is really getting at, I think, is that God forgives us a lot. God is constantly, constantly wiping away our sins. We heard Miss Sharon sing so beautifully our psalm for today that says that God is gracious. That means forgiving. That God is merciful. That also means forgiving. God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God forgives and forgives and forgives and forgives. When we get up to 77 check marks, what do you think happens when we get to 78? Well, we're forgiven then too. That's what Jesus has come to do, to wipe our slate clean over and over and over again. And as we trust and believe in the forgiveness that God has given us in Jesus, as that forgiveness is poured into our hearts, it starts to overflow. It starts to bubble out of us, making it a little easier for us to forgive each other. Let's pray. Lord God, you know how difficult it is sometimes for us to forgive each other. And so we pray today that you would forgive our lack of forgiveness or our struggle to forgive. We pray, Lord, that you would fill us up today with your forgiveness, that you would put in our ears the good news that we are forgiven so that our hearts would be moved to extend that forgiveness to each other. We ask it in your name. Amen. Thanks so much, guys. Take care. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Last week we heard Jesus lay out a template of sorts for what to do if one member of the church sins against another. He laid out a procedure for seeking reconciliation. Jesus told his disciples to first go to the person one-on-one. Don't go tell everybody else first. Go to the person one-on-one and point out the sin in an attempt to regain that one. Jesus went on to say that if that doesn't work, bring one or two others with you, not to gang up on any, but to help as mediators to help sort things out. If that doesn't work, Jesus says, bring it to the church. More than just a, a manual to be woodenly followed, Jesus is encouraging his followers to seek reconciliation when someone sins against them. This is about the diligent practice and pursuit of forgiveness. Well, today we pick up right where we left off last week, and today we hear Peter beg the question, how many times should we be doing this? Lord, Peter begins, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Peter probably thought he was being generous here, and in a way he he was. Most rabbis at the time I've I've read uh, had a three strikes you're out policy. That would be a great thesis to talk about uh, the connection between the Talmud, the ancient Talmud, and baseball. Maybe maybe there's there's something there. I don't know. Yeah, David would help me with that. So Peter ups the strike count to seven. And then Jesus goes on to up the ante even more. Not seven times, Peter, Jesus replied, but 77 times. Now, this passage is notoriously difficult to translate. So some of your Bibles have Jesus saying 70 times seven, which, of course, would be 490 times. But however you translate it, the point is the same Jesus is calling for an amount of forgiveness far beyond anything anyone expected. And to make this point further, Jesus tells a parable. He speaks of a king who has a slave who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, it's important for us to understand that a single talent, one talent, was worth 15 years of wages for a slave, and this slave owed 10,000 talents. This means it would take him 150,000 years to pay it back. It's a ridiculous amount, obviously exaggerated for the purpose of the parable. To put it in modern terms, if you translate it and calculate it into modern terms, it is equal to the equivalent of approximately a bazillion dollars. That's what I would suggest. It's an impossible sum. That's the point. 
Well, the king decided it was time to collect his bazillion dollars, and when the slave couldn't pay, obviously, he ordered his slave to be sold along with his wife and his children and all his possessions. This wasn't even going to touch the principal, but at least he'd get something. And so the slave fell to his knees, begging the king for patience. The king then had pity on him and forgave him the entire bazillion dollars of debt. Scene two in the parable, this newly liberated slave is leaving the palace in a pretty darn good mood when he sees a buddy of his who owes him a couple of hundred dollars. He decides it's time to collect on that debt, so he grabs the guy by the throat and says, pay up, bub. And when his buddy can't come up with the money, he has him thrown into prison. Scene three. The king gets wind of this and is furious. He has his slave hauled back in. He says to him, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? The entire bazillion dollar debt is then reinstated and the slave is to be tortured until he pays back every last penny. End of parable. Does that answer your question, Peter? Aren't you glad you asked? <laughs> When Peter asked Jesus how often he should forgive, Jesus did more than just give him a number. He gave him a new perspective. Through this parable, with its exaggerated figures and its high drama, Jesus pushed Peter to see himself in a new light. Not merely as someone who is owed something when someone sins against him, but as someone who has himself been forgiven much. You see, Peter had incurred a great debt. His sin had put him in a deep hole with God. You might be wondering what he did exactly to fall into that deep hole of debt with God. He hadn't cut anyone's ear off yet. That's coming in a couple chapters. He hasn't denied Jesus yet. That's coming up too pretty quickly. So what did he do? Well, he was simply born. You see, sin isn't just something we do. It is a condition that we are all born into. It is a condition we all inherit as human beings. We are born in a condition of radical self-centeredness, of wanting to do our own thing, of wanting to go our own way, of wanting to be our own gods. And this condition of sin, with its many and varied symptoms, it presents differently in all of us, but this condition of sin puts all of us in a hole with God. The New Testament often uses the language of debt to describe how sin affects our relationship with God. Early in my ministry, in my first congregation in Montana, I also served at the Presbyterian Church in town. And in their worship service, in the translation of the Lord's Prayer that they use, they use the language of debts and debtors in the petition on forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is a reminder that we all owe approximately a bazillion dollars in damages for our condition of sin. That's what Peter owes. That's what we owe, too. Jesus is trying to help Peter and us to see our situation more clearly. He's trying to help Peter and us see the truth about ourselves. We are all deeply indebted to God who has been gracious to us by forgiving that entire debt. That's what he's done for us in Jesus. That entire debt is written off. Shouldn't we then be gracious to those who sin against us? Well, what does this mean for us? What does this look like in daily life? Well, as you well know, no human relationship can endure very long, anyway, without forgiveness. Forgiveness is the oil in the engine of any human relationship, especially the close ones. Ruth Graham, the wife of Billy Graham, once said that a happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. Always like that. As I mentioned at the beginning, Swedish theologian Bo Geert said that in the church, forgiveness is the air one breathes. We hope that's true about the church. It is the air we breathe as the church. 
unless we forgive the daily debts that we incur with one another, everything seizes up. Relationships crack. We simply must learn to forgive if we're going to have any kind of human relationships that will continue, let alone thrive. And we do this forgiving in light of the enormous forgiveness that we all have received from God. As Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We receive God's forgiveness and we share God's forgiveness. We breathe in God's forgiveness of our trespasses, of of our enormous debt, and we exhale forgiveness for the trespasses and the debts rung up against us. But it is important to also point out what forgiveness does not mean. Forgiveness is not the toleration of sinful actions. Prior to our reading for today, Jesus encouraged Peter to confront sin, to point it out. Turning the other cheek does not mean turning a blind eye. Certain behavior, certain symptoms of sin need to be restrained. They need to be stopped. Boundaries need to be drawn. They sometimes even need to be punished. There is a place for earthly justice in the Christian worldview, to be sure. The practice of radical forgiveness does not mean becoming a doormat. It does not mean accepting or tolerating harmful or destructive behaviors. I feel so strongly that this needs to be pointed out because we see again and again how a naive or simplistic or frankly, unbiblical understanding of forgiveness leads to all kinds of terrible problems. We forget that Jesus calls his people to be wise as serpents, even as we are innocent as doves. We are to discern what shape forgiveness might take, taking into account that evil must be restrained. It is an undiscerning forgiveness which excuses or ignores bad behavior, allowing it to continue to hurt people. It is an undiscerning forgiveness which has allowed priests to continue to abuse children, only to be absolved by their bishops and transferred to another parish. It is an undiscerning forgiveness which has which have led some wives to return again and again to an abusive husband only to tell the police or the judge or the social worker that they learned in church that they were supposed to forgive. It is an undiscerning forgiveness which advocates for free bond or lenient consequences for violent criminals who then go out and hurt or even kill more people. This is not the kind of forgiveness we should be teaching This kind of forgiveness does not make us Christians, it makes us enablers. A good case study in forgiveness is given to us in the horrific murders at the historic Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina. A man named Dylan Roof attended a Bible study at the church, eventually opening fire on the participants, killing nine people. Dylan is white, while all of his victims were black. This is relevant because Roof's stated intention in the shooting was to try to trigger a race war. Thankfully, a radical act of forgiveness thwarted this effort. Just 48 hours after the shooting, Roof was before a judge at his bond hearing. Family members of the victims were in attendance. One of them, a woman named Nadine Collier, whose mother was killed by Roof, fought back tears as she said to him, I forgive you. You took something precious from me, she went on to say. I will never talk to my mother again. I will never be able to hold her again. But I forgive you and have mercy on your soul. Now notice carefully what happened here. She wept. She grieved. Forgiveness doesn't mean dismissing the harm. 
Notice that she named the sin. She didn't excuse or ignore it. She named it. She pointed to what he took from her. Notice also that she did not ask for Ruth to be set free. She didn't offer to pay his bond. She didn't ask that he would have a reduced sentence. Her forgiveness was directed at his soul. There were others who offered similar words of forgiveness, all of it spontaneous. None of them talked to each other or decided ahead of time what they would say. And another family member, Chris Singleton, whose mother was also killed by Ruth, spoke to a reporter after the the hearing, and he said, I truly hope that people will see that it wasn't just us saying words. I know for a fact, he said, that it was something greater than us. It was something greater than us. Forgiveness doesn't always come in 48 hours. Sometimes it can take 48 years or more to get there. Sometimes it is an ongoing, lifelong struggle. But whenever forgiveness does come, it comes from something greater than us. Forgiveness is not so much an act of the will as it is a fruit of the Spirit. It is something God works in us. It's something that is called and coaxed out of us by God as we live in the light of His forgiveness of our enormous debt to Him. Today, through word and sacrament, through parable and promise, Jesus shows us how much we have been forgiven. A bazillion dollars of debt, for crying out loud. Our forgiveness came at a great cost. The cost of his life. The cost he willingly paid for us. Our king took the loss himself in order to grant us forgiveness. And as this forgiveness is given to us, it begins to flow through us as well. Thanks be to God. Amen. I want you to stand as we sing. Let us now confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now pray for the church, for the world, and for all people in any need. Please join me in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we pray for your church throughout the world. Make forgiveness the air we breathe. Make your church a place where your forgiveness is breathed in through the hearing of your word and the sharing of your supper and breathed out in the mercy we show to each other. Lord, in your mercy. Creator God, we pray for your world. Guide the leaders of nations to pursue truth and reconciliation, justice and mercy. Lead us all to live lives of both compassion and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy. Renew the life and health of all who are afflicted in any way by the powers of sin, sickness, or death. Heal all their infirmities and crown them with your mercy and love. Assure all in any need that you are near and that in both life and death we belong to you. Lord, in your mercy. Giver of life, we pray for those in our congregation who are celebrating birthdays this week, including George Broughton, Candy Amarello, Carol LaFond, and Michael Reitz. With these friends, we rejoice in your gift of life. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you established the covenant of marriage and you continue to sustain it through the gracious hearts of good forgivers. We pray for those in our congregation celebrating wedding anniversaries, including Dave and Candy Amarello and Tyler and Jessica Hart. Continue to bind them together joyfully as one. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, Lord, for those for whom forgiveness is elusive or a struggle, for those whose hurts are deep. Continue to pour out upon them your forgiveness. Give them patience with themselves and their situation until the day when forgiveness at last extinguishes all anger and bitterness and all troubled souls can be reconciled to you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, you are our gracious King who has canceled our entire debt of sin through your death and resurrection. As your people, make us rich in mercy, abounding in kindness, tireless in good works, and joyful in praising you, the source of all mercy. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up our prayers to you, O God, trusting your promise to hear us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of God's peace with one another. Right. I'll let you get back to your spots here. A few announcements to highlight for you this morning. First of all, today we have our child protection policy training in the library at 11:45. This is for folks who like to serve uh, as volunteers. Well, anything with youth, really, but um, it's particularly our Munchie Monday program. We're recruiting some new volunteers for that. So if you need 
our child protection policy training, or if you haven't done it in a couple of years, we uh, need you to do that again. Uh, you should have been contacted if you're out of date. Um, but that's down in the library at 1145 today. Anything to add to that, Beth, or is that good? Okay, thanks. Uh, also tonight we have our confirmation kickoff. It's a casual gathering. We're going to have some pizza and mostly I'll just be handing out the workbooks and uh, talking about the program, give you the schedule for the year ahead and just spend some fun time together with pizza and our new materials. Wednesday is the newsletter deadline. Uh, please get that stuff to Martha promptly by Wednesday. We have a very full October in our congregation. A lot of things are going on. So in order for her to squish it all in, uh, she needs to have some time to do that. So and I'll be submitting a lot of stuff. Um, so get your stuff to Martha for the newsletter by Wednesday, please, for October. Uh, also on Wednesday, choir will be meeting. Our um, chancel choir meets at 4 o'clock. We just started rehearsals. So we'd love to have some new voices with us. So you're invited and welcome to join us for choir practice at 4 o'clock on Wednesday. Those of you who might be interested in Yubilati Ringers, our handbell group, uh, they will not be uh, resuming uh, rehearsals now until October 4th. Uh, you might see in print some other things. It was some, there's some confusion there in the scheduling. Uh, but Ron and Jan are gone right now. They'll be back. Uh, so rehearsals for the ringers will start October 4th. That's a Wednesday at 5.15. The class that I taught this morning, the Sunday morning adult ed class, why do we have pastors? It's a very urgent question for me to get right. I know. Um, that class will be repeated on Wednesday night. We're doing this series of topical Bible studies. So if you missed this morning's class, uh, you can join us Wednesday night at 7. We had a fantastic turnout last Wednesday. The tables were all full of people. Uh, it was great. So I uh, hope to see some of you back uh, Wednesday night for that class. Uh, just so you know, Thursday and Friday, Bloodworks Northwest will be using our facilities for another blood drive. We're happy to be able to host them. Uh, for those who might have donations for the Watoto garage sale, which is coming up this weekend, please hold on to your stuff until uh, Friday at 4.30. We need time to get the Bloodworks folks uh, out of here and then make room for your stuff. So please bring it in Friday at 4.30 or shortly thereafter. Um, the Watoto team will be there to receive your items then. And then if you want to buy stuff, you can come back on Saturday, buy somebody else's stuff. Uh, you can pick, uh, come back uh, between 9 and 3 is when the Watoto garage sale is happening. Of course, all proceeds go to support Watoto Child Care Ministries in Uganda. A couple prayer concerns to lift up uh, to you this morning. Uh, Mary Warner had a very long surgery, eight hours at least, worth of surgery on Monday. And she has come through that well and is up and taking long walks now and uh, still at the hospital, but doing great. Should be home soon. I'm expecting that she's home soon. We give thanks for uh, that and that the surgery uh, appears to have been successful. So uh, praise be to God for that. Also, I got word from Lauren Wheeler that Al Wheeler uh, got through his cardiac procedure that he had on Friday and uh, is doing well. That was just an outpatient one. They stayed up in Bellingham. Uh, Al should be home today, um, but he's doing well and feeling better. Uh, for Karen Peterson, we need ongoing prayer. She has some significant uh, health concerns facing her. So prayers for Karen and for Pete. She has another important appointment uh, tomorrow. Uh, please keep them both in your prayers. There are some inserts that have uh, more information. I hope that you'll take a look at, including the schedule, full schedule for the week ahead, noting the changes that I mentioned. Um, the connection card is your place to sign up to volunteer for different things or let us know you're coming to different things. If you are a visitor today, you can also use that yellow card to provide whatever contact information you're able to share with us or willing, comfortable sharing with us uh, that we might make a further connection with you. Those can go in the offering plates when they come around here shortly or you can give them to me on your way out today. We resume our worship now with some special music. Gentle arms that right my path Show your love instead of wrath In this hour, precious hour I have met redemption's power In this place, holy space I have seen amazing grace Blistered souls begin to heal, cease 
to hide that which is real. Walls I build dissolve away. In this hour when I pray, in this hour, precious hour, I have met your healing power. In this place, holy space, I have seen amazing grace. Then gentle words between us flow. Starts easy, mine starts slow. But patiently you listen close to every burden I disclose. In this hour, precious hour, I have met compassion's power. In this place, holy space. can't yet say and when I can't quite reach you you run to me halfway and if my heart is silent you still stay in this hour when I pray in seasons of distress and grief my Thank you so much, Karen and Verna, for that beautiful piece. Our worship continues now with the offering.
please stand. Let us pray. Merciful God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, sign of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. In mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his holy supper. Amen. 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 Lord Jesus. Dear friends, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us now pray together using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our gracious King comes to us now through bread and wine to renew us in the cancellation of all of our debts to him. Come, for all is ready. Please be seated.
please stand as you're able. And now the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace this day and always. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy, you would strengthen us through this gift in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.